If you do like these tank chats, do please subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel. Today I'm standing by the uh, Pack 4341. What I'm going to talk about first is the origins of this gun, how it got from the camp to the museum. The Pack 4341 by the side of me um, started off life when it arrived in Allied hands as a, a gate guardian on one of the MOD sites. The problem with gate guardians is that basically they're standing outside to all elements. We see this with AFVs, we see this with um, the anti-tank guns. And what happens is the rain, the snow, etc., sits in pools on the actual carriages, on the actual guns itself, and we get a lot of rust. So when this was given to us, this has probably been sitting outside for 30 plus years. So the team, really led by um, Les Wilkins up at the workshops, really made a five-year effort to put this back and restore it back to this fantastic condition that it is in. Um, and it really is a, 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 a proper restoration. It also adds another element to our story. We're used to seeing the tanks, the, um, the armoured fighting vehicles, but the, this really shows an anti-tank gun that could hold its own in terms of firepower at that time with the, with the tanks that were being developed. And it shows the scale of the guns that were being developed as well. Because this anti-tank gun, if you came across it on the battlefield, would deal damage just like the King Tiger. Let's talk about the history of the Pat 4341. Before you get the anti-tank gun, you get the arrival of the tank on the battlefield. So 5th of September, 1916, Battle of Fleur Corselette. You get C and D companies of the Heavy Branch and Machine Gun Corps with their Mark I tanks attacking the German lines. Now, the German soldiers never seen anything like this. They don't know how to attack these lumbering beasts that are coming towards them. The German field gunners, who are effectively the elite unit, they treat it as another target. They use their field guns, the 7.7 centimeter um, field gun artillery piece over open sight and start engaging these tanks that are moving at two to three miles an hour and they knock some of them out. So for the German field gunners using their artillery piece this is the first incident of anti-tank gunnery. It is not a designed anti-tank gun but is capable of engaging the tanks and with their 12 millimeter armour they're overmatched by that 7.7 centimeter shell. So the first case of anti-tank guns was more by necessity. It wasn't a design gun. When we get to the Battle of Combray on 20th November 1917, we are starting to see the development in the German army of actually training troops, their field gun troops, to engage tanks. To be one battery and one commander and specifically a gun effectively stalled the advance of the British at, uh, at the Battle of Combray. And again, that wasn't by luck, and that wasn't using anti-tank guns, that was done by training and knowing how to knock the, knock the tanks out and learning how to do it. We also at that time get the development of the um, anti-tank rifle, the tank Gewehr. The Germans are seeing more and more of the British and, and the French using um, tanks, mass use of tanks. So they start developing weapons for their units to actually start engaging with. So by the summer of 1918, we're seeing the tank Gewehr, the, the anti-tank rifle being developed. Now this will fire a 13.2 millimetre cord round into the actual tank. It's, a, it's basically an upscaled Mauser and gives the infantry something to actually use against the tanks coming towards them. And these would have been handed around to units during that summer of 1918. It has an effective range of about 200 metres and unless it hits something vital or an individual in the tank, it can't do too much damage. It's not like the 7.7 centimetre round. It can't do that level of damage. We really then have to jump up to the sort of late 1920s, early 1930s, um, where we start getting the development of dedicated anti-tank guns. What happens is though, the scale of the actual gun, the calibre of the gun actually comes down. And you're seeing these guns, which with the Germans becomes the uh, Pack 35-36, it's a 3.7 centimetre gun being developed um, along with, at the same time, you start seeing the British two-pounder and the French Hotskish 25 millimeter gun. Now, these guns are dedicated anti-tank guns. They're very small, so you'll get a shield about this high, a small gun here, and uh, the ability to fire upwards of about 15 shots a minute. So they're, they're designed to engage um, enemy tanks 
of the time, for that period of the, the, the late 20s and into the 1930s. These are light armoured tanks. You're not seeing heavier armour than, say, 20, 30 millimetres of armour. And so the anti-tank guns are designed to knock out those types of tanks. And they can penetrate roughly around about 40-odd millimetres at, say, 500 metres. That's not fantastic, but it's enough to knock the tanks out at that time. We move forward then to the start of World War II and the Germans have stolen a march really, on, on, especially on the British and French. They've not only developed their panzer force, they've developed this anti-tank, their tank um, hunting capability. So they have these anti-tank gun um, companies being developed. You'll have a battalion of them, up to 36 of these guns in a battalion, and they will be in the vanguard of things like their, um, their panzer divisions. They will be the only motorised troops in their infantry divisions at times because you need them to move around the battle because if there's a breakthrough by enemy tanks, they can be deployed against them. So the Germans have really looked at this. So you get to... Um, Poland in, in, in September 1939 and you get France 1940 and these are effective. They can engage the Allied tanks that they're coming across and they're able to knock them out. They have a four to one advantage in terms of anti-tank guns versus British and French tanks. The problem is what you'll start seeing is that gun, that 3.7 centimetre gun on the Pat 3536 is obsolete. And so they've started already in the late 1930s and early 1940 to develop the Pac-38. This is a five centimetre gun. When you see the Germans attacking into Russia, the Soviet Union, on, on June, in June 1941, you're going to start to see um, the Germans deploy most of their Pac-35-36 and starting to introduce these Pac-38s. Because what happens with Pac-35-36 it becomes known as the door knocker and that just keeps bouncing off um, the, um, the Soviet tanks, the T-34 and the KV-1s. The Pat 35-36 weighs about 435 kilograms. We then go up to the Pac-38 with a 5 centimetre. That's now basically doubled in weight. That's over 900 kilograms, approaching 1,000 kilograms, almost a metric tonne. So you're getting a bigger gun, but you're getting better capability. And it's the gun that you will see on things like the Panzer III Aus L, that we have in the museum. It has a potency, but that lasts only for a short while. The problem is, is what's happening at the same time is armour's getting thicker on the tanks. So you're going to need a bigger gun after that. So the Pac-38 really comes in in 1940. You're really looking at it around about 1942, 43, where it's obsolete again. So the Pac-40, which has also been developed, this really is the gun that you start seeing on the um, the Panzer IV, the later, the later version, so the H onwards. This is the one where it's really going to have that penetrative power. It's going to be able to knock over 100 millimetres of armour at about 1,000 metres. So it's starting to actually engage things like the Shermans and, and the T-34s at longer ranges. The previous guns, the Pac-35, 36 and Pac-38, have been designed to ambush. They were easy to conceal and hide. They'd wait till you got close into them and then fire at you. The Pac-40 is used at longer ranges, so they're starting to engage on the front at far longer ranges than they have before. And so they're using these guns in a far more um, aggressive but defensive manner. So they're knocking out tanks at a thousand metres rather than waiting for a few hundred. And so the Pac-40 becomes the gun of the sort of German anti-tank um, troops and that will weigh about 1,400 um, kilograms. So you start needing proper prime movers to move it around. What you start seeing, of course, though, is the Germans are putting these guns onto um, far more self-propelled platforms as well as their tanks. And that means that they've got more mobility. The problem with anti-tank guns is, is that they can get outflanked and they can get overrun. And it's very hard to actually get the, the guns back. So with the Pac-4341, it actually, if you look at it, it's actually its lineage. It goes back to the Flak 88. Now that goes back really to the First World War and the German Navy. The German Navy were, um, had already in its um, inventory uh, an 8.8 centimetre gun. And the reason why they chose 8.8 centimetres is because of the size of the round. It was one piece ammunition and the loader could load it 
without getting too fatigued. It was easy enough for one man to, to, to lift. If you go up to the 10.5 centimetre gun, that's, that, that round starts getting bigger and you start getting two-piece ammunition. It takes longer time to actually use them. The German army in 1916 likes this gun because they are looking at anti-aircraft guns. So basically they're looking at the 8.8 centimetre gun as an anti-aircraft gun. And that's how it stays. It becomes in part of the German army uh, moving forward. And so 1920s, 1930s, you have these flak units being capable of engaging aircraft at high altitudes. What you start getting, though, is that you start developing in the 1930s as a capability of engaging enemy ground targets. So that has that capability. The problem for the Flak 88 is its height. A very high gun. You're looking at eight, nine-man crew. It's on this cruciform um, turntable. So it's got 360-degree um, turntable, again, for engaging um, aircraft targets. But it gives it a very effective um, uh, platform. And that gun, the, the 88 uh, centimetre gun, which is an L56, it's the same one on the Tiger I, effectively, it allows it to engage targets at far longer ranges um, than we've seen before. So when you're um, getting into the campaigns of 39 and 40, the Germans are able to use these, if needed, to engage allied armour that is heavier than the Pac-35-36 can defeat. So basically, these are able to be used, especially like by Rommel's um, 10th um, Panzer Division at uh, Arras, along with the artillery. They are able to stop the Matildas that are coming towards them. And this will burst a round through you at 1,500, 2,000 metres. And they developed the Panzer Granate round, the, uh, the, the 39 round, which is basically their anti-armour round. And that has a small explosive charge just behind the cap. So it basically penetrates through your armour and you get an explosive charge into the actual crew compartment. So it's a devastating round when it hits you. So the Flak 88 exists, but as we've been seeing, the armour on Allied tanks in 42, 43, etc. starts getting bigger and um, sloped armour coming in, it's harder to penetrate with the existing guns they've got. And so they're looking at a platform to take the 88 on its cruciform platform as a, as a big flat gun and put it onto an anti-tank gun, anti gun platform. So they come up with a Pac-43. So this is Krupp really designing this. And again, it's on a cruciform platform. It's got a low silhouette for the size of the gun. And it's going to be probably the best anti-tank gun of World War II, especially from the German side of it. It has that killing power of the L71-88, um, which is on the King Tiger. It can knock through over 180 millimetres worth of armour at 1,500 metres plus. So it's starting to engage targets at much longer distances. And this is what the Germans are doing. They're building these heavier anti-tank guns and being able to knock targets out at longer ranges. The problem for the Germans is this gun on its platform is really good, but they're getting bombed by Allied bombing. So basically their production line is being halted. Um, and so really what's happened is they produced a lot of barrels, but don't have the carriages to put it on. So they start looking around to improvise this. And what they find is that they've got their 10.5 centimetre howitzer, and they're looking at that and thinking, actually, we, if we mount this gun on that carriage, that could take it. So they start looking at it, they mount it at four points and they're able to marry those two together. Then they're looking around and saying what sort of wheel set could we have and we get the, um, the 15 centimetre howitzer and they take the wheels off of that. So you've got the carriage and wheels from two other artillery pieces being joined together, married together and then the barrel being fitted on along with a separate, um, separate shield here. And this is how we get this two-wheeled anti-tank gun. It is not as low um, in terms of its silhouette as the Pac-43, but the Pac-43-41 is, is a weapon of necessity. They've got the gun barrels, they just need to marry it up. And this is how you get this gun. So it's not the world's best design, but it's improvised and it can do a job. We've gone up in weight though to 4.38 tons, metric tons. So it's, it's a big old beast. It's nine metres long. It's effectively two metres in height. And you can see that it's about two and a half metres in width. This is a hard gun to hide. So when you're at the, one of the crew members on here or you're the commander of a, a battery, locating these guns is going to be difficult. The weight of this 
this gun, the, the way it starts sinking in soft ground means that realistically, once you've emplaced it, you are effectively going to struggle to actually um, get it out of its position. You need prime movers, heavy half tracks to actually remove these guns. You've got to limber it up. It all takes minutes to actually basically take the gun away from its position. And by that time, you could be outflanked. So really, you're looking at these guns doing the damage at 2,000 meters plus and engaging the T-34-85s, the IS-2s, etc. This is what these guns are going to be doing. As a anti-tank gun, this was devastating. This would knock out, at, uh, there were records of them knocking out six um, T-34s uh, over two and a half um, um, kilometres away. Um, basically, um, if you can see it, you could knock it out with this gun. There are also um, reports of the engine block in a T-34 being knocked five metres out the back of the actual tank at 500 metres. This is the power of this gun. This will fire um, an HE round out to, well, 15,000 metres. And the Germans w were, by the late part of the war, late 44, 45, needing to use as many pieces as possible for their artillery as well. So it is being used in that dual gun role as well. But because they're not motorised, because they're not on their own, um, um, under their own power, they are vulnerable to being bypassed and surrounded and just left. It has the actual sighting apparatus here for the telescope and the crew behind this double skinned, um, um, basically, shield to protect them with. You haven't got much protection. The actual electric firing pin is on one of the elevating wheels. It's actually on the elevating wheel there for the gunner. When you fire this, you're going to get this traveling um, back about 60 to 80 centimeters. That's the recoil going on. You've got the famous double baffled um, muzzle brake there to try and divert some of those gases up so you get a little bit less coming back. But realistically, when this is firing, this gun is gonna move, it's gonna jump effectively. It's just the problematic that it is so large and it's known as the, um, the barn dwarf by the German troops because it's so big. The other problem you've got with these is barrel wear. Um, the Germans knew that with, if you use their standard ammunition through this, that with the, the rifling inside the actual gun itself, you would have, you have about 500 um, rounds worth of usage before you went through it. So what they start doing is in developing um, a new um, um, driving band on their, on their rounds, um, which was sintered. And effectively, that gave it a life over a thousand rounds. They realized that they can't keep going through 500, uh, you know, 500 rounds and then needing a new barrel all the time because that's not where they are at that time. But it is a very potent, effective gun. And it's the gun that we start seeing um, being developed and put on things like the, um, the Nash horn, you'll see it on the elephant, you'll see it on the Jag Panther, and you'll see it, of course, on the, um, on the Tiger II. Um, that is probably, pound for pound, the best anti-tank gun, along with the long 75 on the Panther, that the Germans have. It has that devastating penetrative power, and it can do it at long range. The problem for the Germans is, they don't really have enough forces to deal with all of the issues that they've got, which is um, American and, and, and Soviet tanks coming towards them, along with British tanks. So there's a lot of tanks on that battlefield. There's never enough guns for the Germans to actually engage them all. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel, and, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organisation, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.